Hello and a very good morning to all of you all. I hope uh, you all had the time to go and review the yesterday's lecture. You were able to go through the video once again, make the notes like I asked you all to do and you've done your homework also hopefully. I uh, saw a lot of questions kept coming for our teachers. Um, main doubts were on direction of electric field and like I kept emphasizing in my lecture the point to keep in mind is when you have a positive charge the field goes away from the charge when you have a negative charge the field comes towards the charge keep that in mind as you draw your um, electric fields at a point to get your resulting field so now we'll continue on with that lecture again just to start a quick recap on uh, what all we have in this chapter we have Coulomb's law which is over we have electric field which is now over we'll be introducing field lines today and field lines will get on to Gauss's law and then we have potential, potential energy work, energy theorem, and finally electric dipole. So Coulomb's law is done, electric field is done. This is what we will do today, along with a bit of Gauss's law. That also we'll do today. Yep. A little bit new again. The content here will be a little new. Field lines is simple, intuitive, but Gauss's law is a little different. Um, you got to take a little while to absorb it, understand it, and uh, to internalize it. Okay, so let's get started. Um, like I said, we're going to be doing uh, electric field lines today. So we want to find out what is a field line and go forward with it. So first question is what are electric lines of force? So I want all of you all, uh, it's very important you write as I talk, not just watch the video, because after a while you start daydreaming. So all of you all have your pens and notebooks ready and please write on at the top. Electric lines of force will be your heading. So what are electric lines of force? Please write down the definition. A line of force or an electric field line is an imaginary line along which a used unit positive charge tends to move when placed in the field. I will explain it in a moment, but I want all of you all just take a few seconds to write down the definition. Electric lines of force is your heading. And you have written down by now in your notebook a line of force or an electric field line is an imaginary line it doesn't exist it's just something that we imagine and draw in our minds along which a unit positive charge tends to move when placed in the field so suppose i have a positive charge here plus q i want to find along which line will an unit positive charge tend to move so if i put a unit positive charge here this is my test charge plus one is the charge on that charge. I place it in the vicinity of the um, main charge plus Q. Coulomb's law, there's gonna be repulsion. Repulsion will be acting in this direction. So the test charge tends to move towards the right. If I now go place a test charge over there and I say, hey, how is that guy going to move? Again, it gets repelled and it tends to move along the same straight line outwards. I then put a charge there so if I join all of these, you'll get a line like this. This is one of the electric field lines. It's an imaginary line that we've drawn. And any point, if I put a positive charge anywhere I put, this will tell me in which way it is going to move. If I put a charge here, for example, then it is going to be repelled like this. And then it will continue moving like this. So it will be a straight line going out that way will be the imaginary line along with the unit positive charge will go likewise if i put on the left you will have your lines of force will be straight lines going radially outward when i have a positive charge now if i put a negative charge for example i take the same thing and i put a minus q over here a negative charge now if i put a test charge over here is it going to be attracted or repelled it's going to be attracted It'll get pulled inside, then I put a charge over there, it'll still get pulled inside. So you'll still have a straight line, but the straight line will have an arrow marking it inwards. If I take a point here, then the line of force, sorry, the line of force will be coming radially inward. Here the line of force will come radially inward. So understood it? What is a line of force? It's an imaginary line along which a unit positive charge tends to move when placed in that field. So in your notebook, I just would have the definition. What I've drawn over here, just hold on a minute. We'll come to it in a moment. So 
go on to the next slide what are the main characteristics the six or seven important characteristics of the lines of force what's the first important characteristics electric lines of force are radially outward for an isolated positive charge and are radially inward for an isolated negative charge that's what we did just now in the previous slide if i look at the positive charge it is radially outward the lines of force and if i look at negative charge they are radially inward so that's what is the first property of lines of force or if you'll kindly write it down electric lines of force are radially outward for an isolated positive charge and are radially inward for an isolated negative charge and here are some diagrams a neater diagram that is drawn there you can kindly draw this diagram also in your notebook with the first property of the first diagram of your lines of force so the straight line is important and the arrow is also important every line you have to show the arrow you don't show the arrow you miss the the point and uh, if it's a question in the examination you will lose marks as well so along with drawing the line you also have to draw the arrows and positive is outward negative the arrows are inwards all of you all done that's the first characteristic of a lines of force right of lines of force are radially outward for a positive charge and radially inward for a isolated negative charge okay second property yep please write it down electric lines of force originate from a positive charge and terminate at a negative charge so if i have for example a positive charge over here this is a positive charge the line of force starts from the positive charge this is the arrow and where does it end up it ends up on the negative charge similarly any other line i take the lines of force will come like this starts on a positive charge and ends or terminates at a negative charge all of you all kindly write that statement and also draw the diagram where you have a positive charge and negative charge and you are drawing the lines of force once again make sure the arrows are drawn and also you should draw these three arrows in the back three lines of force over here many children make a mistake of only drawing these lines of force they forget the lines of force at the back you will also have to draw all these lines of force from behind to get the complete picture okay so the second characteristic is electric lines of force originate from a positive charge and terminate at a negative charge super now suppose i don't have two charges i have only one charge then what happens or i have both charges are positive in nature or negative they don't have opposite signs then please note the second point which is there in italics in the absence of an opposite charge the lines terminate at infinity if you go back to the earlier diagram that we did if you look over here this is a positive charge the lines of force where does it go it goes off to infinity it doesn't end anywhere all these lines of force go off to infinity likewise for a negative charge the lines of force are coming from infinity so in the absence of an opposite charge the lines will terminate at infinity that is the second characteristics of the electric lines of force typically in pu they'll ask you to name three characteristics of lines of force and draw the corresponding diagrams so you need to have these diagrams clear how to draw it neatly label the plus q plus q label the arrows drawn all the lines of force okay let's go to the third condition this is most important characteristic of the uh, lines of force most important yep please note it down please write it down point number 3 the direction of the tangent at any point on a line of force gives the direction of the electric field at that point how do i get the direction of the electric field i will get the direction of the electric field from the tangent to the line of force so suppose i have a positive charge a negative charge and i have a line of force going from positive to negative if i want to find the field at the point 1 the tangent this will be the electric field at 1 i want the field at point 2 the tangent e2 is the electric field at point 2 so here's a nice diagram for you 
a more proper diagram. You don't have to draw so many lines of force, just draw three lines of force or two lines of force, that is sufficient. Now look at point one. At point one, the tangent is E1. At point two, the tangent is E2. I take a point three, tangent is E3. If I take the point here four, the tangent drawn to the line, this will be E4. If I have a point here five, suppose this point I take as five, then this way the tangent will be E5. So the direction of the tangent at any point on a line of force gives the direction of the electric field at that point. Okay, that's a very important correct condition. That's point number three. I hope all of you have written it down and I've also had time to draw the diagram. If you don't have time, just please review the lecture find this diagram and draw it once again. Good. Number four, two electric lines do not intersect with each other. Two electric field lines do not intersect, my bad here, with each other. Suppose this one electric field line, line of force, and there's one more electric field line, line of force this way. Now I've shown them intersecting. I made a statement that the electric field lines do not intersect each other. Why is that necessary? If I draw at this point, because of this line, the tangent to this line is this way, this will be the electric field at the point P. Now if I take the second line, this is the second line of force, therefore his tangent should also give the electric field. If I draw the tangent over here, I have the electric field E, therefore the point P there are two directions for the electric field, which is not possible. Yeah, At any point, electric field will have only one direction. I can't have two directions. Therefore, the conclusion is the electric field lines do not intersect each other. And what is the reason for that? Please write it also down. You can draw the diagram if you want. And then you can write down, if field lines intersect, then there will be two tangents at that point implying two directions for the field at that point, which is not possible. If field lines intersect, then there will be two tangents at that point, implying two directions for the field at that point, which is not possible. Therefore, the fourth important characteristic is that two electric lines do not intersect with each other. Characteristic number five, all of you all kindly note it down. In a charge-free region, this is very important, that, that qualification is important. In a charge-free region, meaning a region where there is no charge. In a charge-free region, electric field lines can be taken to be continuous curves <clears throat> without any breaks. In a charge-free region, electric field lines can be taken to be continuous curves without any breaks. So if you look, for example, you have the positive charge over here. If I look at the field line, it goes off to infinity. It has no breaks. Once I leave, if I leave the charge and I look what happens after the charge, is just as a line, continuous line going off to infinity. There is no break in that line. The only time I'll get a break in a line is when I have a charge. Suppose I have charge which is, for example, like a, a sheet of charge. We will learn that later when you do application of Gauss's law. You can have one thin sheet of charge. Suppose this has some charge, there's some charge Q on that sheet. Now, if you look on the right side of the sheet, I'm sorry, you will end up having electric fields going to the right. And if you look at the left side of the sh sheet, the electric fields will go to the left. So on either side, if I just show the sheet as a line, on either side of the sheet, the electric fields are in opposite directions. So the field line has broken. At this sheet, at this point, the field line has broken. 
one is this way, the other is this way, it is not continuous. But then why is it broken? Because there is a charge over there. So if a charge comes in, the field line will be broken. If it is a charge-free region, electric field lines will be continuous curves without any breaks. No reason to draw these diagrams. I just wanted to get the idea. Make sure you've written down this statement. In a charge-free region, electric field lines can be taken to be continuous curves without any breaks. Next, number six. Electric field lines do not form any closed loops. So electric field lines will have to start from a positive charge, add on a negative charge, or it will have to start from positive charge and go to infinity, or from negative charge and go to infinity. It cannot form a loop. So you can, so any diagram you see, anywhere you see, you will not find electric field lines forming closed loops. That is not possible. And point number seven, you can also note that down. Electric field lines are normal to the surface of a conductor and there are no field lines inside a conductor. Can you note it down? Electric field lines are normal to the surface of a conductor and there are no field lines inside a conductor. Just quickly to understand why that is so. Now, um, when a positive charge is placed in an electric field, when there is an electric field line, the positive charge will experience a force and it will move. Okay. Now, what is the property of a conductor? A conductor has got a lot of free electrons, meaning if I have any electric field, the electrons will start moving. But we are studying a topic called electrostatics. Electro is electron, statics is at rest. We are studying electrons at rest. So if I am dealing with electrostatics and I look at the electrons inside my conductor, my conclusion must be the electrons in the conductor will also be at rest. But if the electrons are at rest, it means there is no force on the electron. If there is no force on the electron, it means there is no electric field inside for the electron to feel a force. Therefore, if there is no electric field inside, there are no field lines inside the conductor. Got the logic? I will start again. Conductors have free electrons. If a field is there, they will move. But I am studying electrostatics. Therefore, electrons are at rest. If they are at rest, the field must be zero. There is no force. If there is no force, field must be zero. If field is zero, there are no lines inside the conductor. So that explains why there are no field lines inside the conductor. But why should field lines be normal to the surface of the conductor? It is the same reason, same logic. Suppose this is my surface over here. Now my field line, if I have electric field, which is at an angle to the surface of the conductor, this is my electric field, then I will have a component which is going to be parallel to the conductor and I have a component which is perpendicular to the conductor. Now, if I have an electron over here on the surface and I have electric field which is parallel to the conductor, the electron will start moving. If the electron starts moving, it is no longer electrostatics, which is violating the chapter we are studying. The electrons are already at rest. If the electrons are already at rest, it means E parallel must be 0. For electron to be at rest implies E parallel, E along the surface is 0. If E along the surface is 0, conclusion implies E is perpendicular to conductor. The electric field that you will have will always be perpendicular to the surface of a conductor. That's point number six and seven. Electric field lines do not form any closed loops and electric field lines are normal to the surface of a conductor and there are no field lines inside a conductor. Yep, these are the uh, seven important um, uh, characteristics. Let's add one more eighth. There's one more characteristic I'll just add in. You can just write down eighth. Please note it down all of you all when field lines are closer together the electric field is stronger 
I'll repeat again. When field lines are closer together, the electric field is stronger. And when field lines are farther apart, the electric field is weaker. When field lines are farther apart, the electric field is weaker. So let me just go to one of the earlier diagrams. If I just go back in, in slides, and yeah, this diagram should be good. If I look at this diagram over here, and I look at the electric field lines, when I'm closer to the charge, when I look at these positions over here, the field lines are very close together. So here, electric field is high. When I come over here, when I look at the space between the field lines, they are further apart. So here, my electric field is low. Where my field lines are farther apart, the electric field is low. Where the field lines are closer together, the electric field is high. So these are the eight important characteristics of uh, your lines of force. Uh, let's do a couple of examples on drawing electric field lines. So example number one. These are classic standard questions that typically come in to you to mark questions. So it's important you practice all of these and get them right. Draw the field lines between two positive charges placed a small distance apart. So all of you will write down two positive charges small distance apart. That's your heading. Electric field line when I have two positive charges a small distance apart. Okay, to draw field lines, you start with any point on the paper. You now look at the force from the two charges that come and see which way is that the test charge going to move. That's the direction of your field line. So a, a nice diagram will come shortly, the formal good diagram, but I'll show you how it can be done. So I'll, I'll scribble for you on the side. Uh, don't copy it. I will give the proper diagram shortly. So you have a positive charge here and a second positive charge here. If I take a point over here, this positive charge is going to repel him. The second positive charge will also repel him. Therefore, he's just going to keep on moving outward. No doubt about it. Likewise, if I take a point on this side, he is going to repel him. This charge will also repel him. Therefore, the field line will simply go outward like this. So at the two charges, when I look at the x-axis, they are simply outward. Now, how do the other charges move? Um, suppose I take a charge over here at this point here. He is going to have an electric field which is going to be this big. He is going to have electric field along this direction which is smaller. This is bigger and this is smaller. Now, take the resultant. So, if I take triangle law of addition, this then will be my E resultant. At this point, the resultant electric field will be like this. If he moves here and I say, hey, let me get again the two electric fields. This electric field is going to go this way. This electric field will be this way. And the net resultant will be like this. So in effect, it's going to be ending up going something like this. The lines of force will go like this. If I take a point over here and I look and see what happens to the line of force, it will end up going like this. If I take the center point over here, both charges are equal. This electric field is this way, the other electric field is to the left, net electric field is zero. So at the center point electric field is zero. If I take any other point over here, his electric field will be E1, his electric field here will be E2, and the resultant electric field will go upwards like this. Therefore, you're going to end up having graphs going asymptotically to the y-axis. I'm sorry, my diagram is pretty crappy, but don't worry, I'll give you a nice diagram shortly. But this basically is the logic as to the directions of the lines of force. So the diagram has come on the side. I request you all to please look at the, the um, printed diagram and copy it down. That will be the direction of lines of force when you have two charges facing off each other. I'll just wait for a few seconds for you all to copy it.
okay so i have two charges there plus q plus q it's you can feel them repelling each other it's like they're trying to get together but the lines of force are being pushed apart let's do one more example suppose i have draw the field lines between two negative charges placed a small distance apart i have minus q and minus q if i start from a point on the left it's going to get attracted by both of them therefore the line of force will simply come this way on the right hand side also it's going to get attracted so it will come this way so these two lines are simple to draw if i take a point over here he's going to get attracted because of this and he'll get attracted because of this this is small and this is larger you superimpose this will be your electric field line and so it actually ends up coming in like this coming in like this the diagram is very similar to the earlier diagram except that now the lines of force are actually coming inwards it is the exact same diagram as before except that the arrows are now different so kindly draw the diagram i have two charges minus q and minus q that is the electric line of force for between these two charges if they ask you this question in your board exam you are expected to draw at least one line here then one line here one line here one line here four lines then this side sorry, five six seven lines then repeat the same thing over here one two three four five yeah at least those lines you should draw a minimum number of lines okay perfect let's go to the next example example three ha huh. draw the field lines when a positive charge is placed in front of a plane conductor this is a nice one challenge question i want you all to try it uh, this is my conductor yeah infinite big conductor and i put a positive charge q in front of that conductor yep i'll try it i'll give you a couple of minutes before i give you the answer what is going to be the line of force field lines when a positive charge is placed in front of a plane conductor so now when i put a positive charge in front of a conductor keep in mind it will attract the free electrons in the conductor and actually you will get a negative charge depositing on the surface of the conductor so electric field lines will get will originate from the positive charge q and it will end on the conductor because there is a negative charge on the conductor and keep in mind the field line should be perpendicular to the conductor so if i take a point directly underneath q because of plus q it will repel and because of the negative charge it will get attracted therefore that field line is very simple it will simply go straight down to the conductor and it will be perpendicular so that's an easy line of force now what happens if you have a point off to the side he is going to be repelling him like this he will repel him he on the other hand is going to attract him because of the electric field will come like this and it will bend it downward slightly so what will happen is the line of force will start it will bend and it will end it will end normal to the surface another line of force will start from here it will bend and nor it, this is the direction and it will also end normal to the surface if i put on top the line of force will simply go off on top if i have something over here the line of force will go and come like this and end normal to the surface it will go like this and end normal to the surface draw the arrows and then you'll end up going up like that that will be the lines of force for a positive charge placed in front of a infinite conductor 
these are the three standard examples that are there. I don't think they'll ask you any more. Uh, positive, positive, negative, negative, positive, negative, and a positive charge in front of a infinite plane conductor. Okay, wonderful. So that completes the idea of electric field lines. You know what they are, the imaginary lines along which uh, uh, free charge would, uh, uh, unit charge would be free to move. The tangent to the electric field line gives the electric field. And um, if the field lines are close together, the electric field is strong. The field lines are further apart, the electric field is weak. Okay, now let's use the next idea of electric field lines to go to the next concept. And that concept is that of electric flux and flux density. All of you all kindly write down in your notebooks. Please note it down. Electric flux and flux density. So what's the definition? Electric flux is a measure of the number of electric field lines passing normally through any surface. So in all the diagrams that I gave you, if I just put a surface and I see how many field lines pass through that surface, a measure of the number of field lines passing through the surface is electric flux. Electric flux is a measure of the number of field lines passing normally through any surface. And mathematically, how do you calculate flux? I'll come to that in a moment. And flux density, density is usually something divided by something. So electric flux density at a point is the number of lines of force passing normally through a unit area of a surface surrounding that point. It's number of field lines passing through a unit area, that is flux density. Flux itself is number of lines passing through the entire area. Number of lines passing through a unit area is flux density, but very important, number of lines passing normally through an unit area of a surface surrounding that point is called the flux density. Kindly write down these two definitions, typical one more question may be there, electric flux and flux density. Now, how do I mathematically calculate what is the electric flux? Electric flux, by the way, is represented by phi. What you see here, phi is your representation of flux. Tomorrow you'll learn, not tomorrow, literally, uh, two months from now you'll learn about magnetic flux. So that time you'll say phi and then write magnetic, you'll say B for magnetic. And if you want to specify electric flux, you'll say phi subscript E. But for now, phi represents flux. So how do I mathematically calculate my electric flux? Okay, the electric flux is the product of the area of the surface and the component of the electric field normal to that surface. Please write it down. Electric flux is the product of the area of the surface and the component of the electric field normal to the surface. So if I have a surface over here, I have electric field line, I can find E parallel and I can find E perpendicular. My flux is equal to E perpendicular times the area A. Okay. It is a product of the area of the surface and the electric field normal to the surface, component of the electric field normal to the surface. So if I just have a more formal diagram drawn, there's a surface over here. This is N cap is your uh, normal to the surface. This is E bar at an angle theta. What is a component of E bar along the normal is nothing but E. So E perpendicular over here along the N cap is nothing but E cos theta. If the area here is dA, then the small flux d phi is equal to E into dA into cos theta. But then when I have two vectors, when do I get cos theta? When I have a dot product, therefore the flux d phi is nothing but E bar dot d A bar. This is an important result that you want. d phi means a small amount of flux. Why is it a small amount of flux? Because the area I have d A is a small area. So the little flux going through the small area is given by E bar dot d A bar. And E bar dot DA bar is nothing but E into DA into cos theta. Kindly note that down. Then I have an area D phi. Electric field is E bar. Then my flux is equal to E into DA times.
times cos theta. If my electric field line and my area vector n cap is in the same direction, if E bar is along the direction of n bar, then what is the angle between the two of them? Theta will be 0. Then what is cos 0? <coughs> cos 0 is 1. Then d phi simply becomes E times dA. So this is my E bar direction and this is my n bar direction n cap. Both are in the same direction. Theta is 0. Therefore, d phi is simply E times dA. If E bar is along n cap, then d phi is equal to E times dA. dA means a small area. E is your electric field and the flux d phi is equal to E times dA. Please note that down also in your notebooks. Now what will be the SI unit of flux? Flux is nothing but E into area. E is electric field, A is area. What is electric field unit, SI unit for electric field? It is Newton per Coulomb. What is SI unit for area? It is meter squared. Therefore, the SI unit of electric flux is Newton meter squared per Coulomb. N m squared c minus 1 is the SI unit of electric flux. Typical question one marker in your PO exam. SI unit of electric flux is Newton meter squared per Coulomb. I did know that down. Also very important, when I take a dot product of two vectors, what is my resultant? Is it a vector or is it a scalar? The dot product of two vectors is a scalar. Flux is nothing but E bar dot DA bar. Therefore, the flux will also be a scalar quantity. Electric flux is a scalar quantity. The SI unit is Newton meter square per Coulomb and it is a scalar quantity. Excellent. Flux is a scalar quantity. How about area? Is area a vector quantity? Because when I go over here, I said it's E bar dot DA bar. Yep. DA bar means it is a area. It's a vector. So is area a vector? Yes, area is a vector. What is the magnitude of the area? It's nothing but the area of the surface. What is the direction of the area vector? It is normal to the surface. The direction of the area vector is normal to the surface. Uh, this diagram is not that clear. Let's take the second diagram over here. I have dA bar over here. So now this is my x, y, z, i, j, k. This is my area dA. dA lies in the x, z plane. dA lies in the x, z plane. If it lies in the exit plane, what is the normal to the exit plane? This is your normal, which is nothing but the y-axis. Normal is the y-axis. And which unit vector represents the y-axis? I cap is for x-axis. J cap is for y-axis. Therefore, you have dA bar is dA in which direction? In the J cap direction. So you take the direction of the area vector normal to the surface which is over there. Please write that down, please copy it. If you have the x, y, z axis and dA lies in the x, z plane, in the x, z plane, the normal is along the y axis and dA bar equals dA times j cap. My apologies, it seems to be having a lot of definitions in this lecture, a lot of fundamentals are being set right. It will lay the ground step for us to now apply these in the second half of the lecture. Uh, like I said, these are all new to you. This whole chapter is going to be new. A lot of ideas are going to be new to you. Um, but it's all about just seeing it once, twice, thrice and becoming familiar with it. As a little child in fifth grade, if I asked you to tell me what is the uh, seven tables, all of us struggle with the seven tables. What is five sevens are? You ask a third standard child, he would struggle. But today, I ask you what is 5 times 7. Hopefully, you'll be able to answer immediately 35. 
Why? You've just used it so many, many more times over the last 15 years that it's now imprinted in your brain. Likewise, lots of new ideas you're learning today, a lot of basic definitions you're learning today. <coughs> Revisit a few times, it'll get imprinted in your mind and it'll not be so difficult any longer. Okay, so uh, let's go on to the next one. So dA bar is dA times n cap, where n cap is unit vector along the normal to the surface. We've done that. Um, write for, let's do an example, write the vector form of the area vector for the following example. So let me take, for example, the same. I have um, uh, x axis, y axis, z axis. I've changed my axis, x, y, z. And I now have a cube on that x, y, z plane. I have a cube over there and the side of the cube is A. Now if I call this surface 1, what is A1 bar? The area vector for surface 1. So that surface 1 is a square. So what is the area of the square? A into A, A squared. So the area of the surface is A squared. Now you have to get the direction. Now the perpendicular to the surface is nothing but the y-axis that I put over here. Therefore, it will be a squared times j cap. My xy is not your normal xyz, so don't get confused by that. Maybe I'll give you one more example where I give you the traditional xyz. If I look at the next surface, if I take this surface over here and I call that surface 2, what is area a2 bar? It is once again a square, so it will be a squared. But now which direction is it pointed? It's not pointed upwards, which is your z-axis. So it's a squared k cap will be your um, area vector for surface 2. And now if I look at this surface here and I call this surface 3 in front. Surface 3 is now pointed. The normal to surface 3 is along the x-axis. Therefore, a3 bar will be a squared times i cap. That is your area vector. Its magnitude is nothing but the area of the surface. And the direction is given by the normal to the surface. Kindly note it down. Now, a cube has how many faces? It has six faces. I've given you three. The other three are on the back side of the cube. And if you look at the normal, they actually point to the opposite. So, the phase which is opposite to one, suppose I call it four, instead of pointing on the plus y axis, it will point along the minus y axis. So, area vector four will actually be minus a squared j cap. 5 will be minus a squared k cap and 6 will be minus a squared i cap. So one set of faces are in the positive x, y, z. The other set of faces will be in the negative x, y, z direction. That's a vector form of area and then flux is equal to e bar dot a bar. Okay. Good. So let's see if we can solve this simple question. Calculate the electric flux across a sphere of radius r at the center of which lies a positive charge. So I have a sphere. The sphere has a radius r and at the center of the sphere I have a charge q. If I take a point p on the surface of the sphere, I want to find out what is the flux through the entire sphere. That's a question I have to solve. Calculate the flux to the entire sphere. Now we know d phi, the flux to a small area, is equal to e bar dot da bar or e into da into cos theta. I have to find e, I have to find da and I have to find theta. These are three things I need to find. Then I'll add it all up to get my answer. So consider a point P over here. What's the distance between point P and, and the center row? It's nothing but r. Therefore, what is your electric field at P? Gauss's law, electric field, we all, I'm sorry, not Gauss's law, Coulomb's law, electric field, we already know. 
electric field is nothing but q by 4 pi epsilon naught r squared is the electric field due to a point charge placed at the center of the sphere. Simple. Now, what is the direction of the electric field? It is a positive charge, so it will be radially outward. So, direction of the electric field will be outward, E bar. Now, this is my surface over here. What is the normal to the surface? It will also be outward, N cap. So, my area vector dA and my electric field E bar are both in the same direction. Therefore, what is the angle theta between dA bar and E bar? will be 0 degrees. Therefore, my d phi is equal to E into dA into cos theta will be nothing but Q by 4 pi epsilon naught r squared into dA into cos theta is nothing but 1. That is my flux because of a little area dA. This little area, I have an area dA. It is a flux because of the little area. Therefore, my total flux, if I add it all up, flux will be nothing but q by 4 pi epsilon naught r squared. You add up all the areas, the little little areas, you add it up, you get the total area, which is the total area of the sphere. What is the total area of the sphere? q by 4 pi epsilon naught r squared into surface area of the sphere is 4 pi r squared. So, your 4 pi r squared, 4 pi r squared cancels off or becomes q by epsilon naught my flux through that sphere is q by epsilon naught. I will repeat it once again as as of you all solve it. Yep. I have a point P on that sphere. The electric field at the point P is q by 4 pi epsilon naught r squared. The direction of the electric field is along the radial direction. The vector dA bar is also along the radial direction. Therefore, the angle between both of them is 0, theta is 0. Therefore, d phi, my flux, is equal to E into dA into cos theta, which is E into dA into 0, cos 0, which is 1. Therefore, it is Q by 4 pi epsilon r squared into dA. That is a flux to a small piece on that sphere. Now, to find the total flux to the sphere, I have to add all the fluxes. Therefore, the total flux is nothing but Q by 4 pi epsilon r squared. When I add up all the dA's, I will get the total area A, so into A. And the area, surface area of the sphere is nothing but 4 pi r squared. So, Q by 4 pi epsilon r squared into 4 pi r squared. The 4 pi r squared cancels off and the flux equals Q by epsilon naught. This tells you what is the flux through a sphere when a charge is inside the sphere. Okay, all of you all have done it down. This is very important because this becomes kind of a basis or lead on to the next law that we've called known as the Gauss's law. So, if you go down to Gauss's law, what do we realize over here? The flux through the sphere is nothing but Q by epsilon naught. So, we've got a Gauss's law or Gauss's theorem which states that the total electric flux through a hypothetical closed surface is equal to 1 by epsilon naught times the total charge enclosed within the surface. See what happened there? The charge within the surface that we had was Q. Enclosed charge is Q. 1 by epsilon naught times or Q by epsilon naught times is the flux to the whole surface. The electric flux, please write it down, all of you. Gauss's theorem or Gauss's law is your heading. And the law states the total electric flux through a hypothetical closed surface is equal to 1 by epsilon naught times the total charge enclosed within the surface. If I write it down mathematically, flux will be equal to 1 by epsilon naught times Q enclosed. E and C refers to enclosed is a charge enclosed or within the surface phi is equal to 1 by epsilon naught times q enclosed and this hypothetical closed surface on which gauss's law is applied is also called the gaussian surface so every now and then you'll hear me say gaussian surface sounds very big sounds very high fi sounds very complicated it's nothing 
Gaussian surface is nothing but one imaginary closed surface. Closed surface means uh, like a sphere uh, or a cylinder or a cube, these are closed surfaces. A sheet of paper is an open surface. A box is a closed surface. Yeah? So any hypothetical surface, closed surface on which you apply Gauss's law is called a Gaussian surface. And what is Gauss's law? The flux to the surface is equal to Q enclosed by epsilon naught. Wonderful. So let's just apply Gauss's law for a few examples, a few points to note. By convention, flux entering the surface is taken as negative and flux leaving the surface is taken as positive. Why? Suppose I have a positive charge Q and I take a Gaussian surface over here. The flux lines will be leaving or entering? The flux lines are leaving. Phi is uh, leaving the surface. And what is your Q enclosed? Q enclosed is positive or negative is plus Q. Therefore, phi leaving the surface is positive. If I have a negative charge minus Q and I take a Gaussian surface over here, now what happens to the flux? The flux lines are coming into the surface, entering the surface. So phi entering is negative because my Q enclosed is negative. My flux entering a surface is negative, a flux leaving the surface is positive. And if I have a, a surface where this flux is entering phi 1 and this flux is leaving phi 2, then what is phi net? Phi 2 is leaving. So is it positive or negative? It is positive. Phi 1 is entering. Is it positive or negative? It's negative. Therefore, the net flux will be phi 2 minus phi 1. Outward is positive, inward is negative. That will be the net flux in that surface. Number of field lines leaving is positive. Number of field lines entering is negative. Flux due to a charge outside the Gaussian surface. This is now interesting. We know that note. When I have a Gaussian surface and I have a charge Q over here, the flux lines go like this. And my flux is equal to Q by epsilon naught. Now what happens if I have the same surface, but I have a charge Q which is outside the surface? What is now the flux through my surface? A charge Q is outside the Gaussian surface. Will it be once again Q by epsilon naught? Will it be minus Q by epsilon naught? Will it be zero? How will I find out what is the flux due to a charge Q outside the Gaussian surface? Keep in mind, flux is nothing but a measure of the number of lines of force passing through the surface. And if the line of force enters the surface, it is negative. If it leaves the surface, it is positive. Now draw a line of force from Q. The line of force will go like this. Over here, it enters the surface. Over here, it leaves the surface. Here, it is positive. Here is negative. Therefore, net is how much? Zero. The line of force entered, so it's negative one. Line of force exited, it's positive one. What's the net line of force? Zero. Any line I take that way from Q, will enter the surface and it will exit the surface. Any line I take will enter the surface negative, exit the surface positive. Therefore, your net flux is zero. When the charge Q is outside the Gaussian surface, there is no net flux in the surface. Are there any electric field lines entering the surface? Yes. Are the electric field lines leaving the surface? Yes. But the net electric field lines is zero. Please don't say there are no field lines. There are field lines, but the net flux is zero. Therefore, flux due to a charge outside the Gaussian surface is zero. Please write down. Net flux through a closed surface for a charge outside the surface is zero. Only when the charge is inside the Gaussian surface, you have electric flux. When the charge is outside the Gaussian surface, there is no electric flux through that surface. Okay, next one. 
an important note on Gauss's law, some important points. Number one, Gauss's law is true for any closed surface, no matter what is the shape or size. I'm sure this question would have already come to you all. Sir, you derived that derivation for Gauss's law, you took a spherical surface, 4 pi r squared cancelled off, that's why it became q by epsilon naught. Is it true for any other surface or is it true only for a spherical closed surface? Okay, how do I prove it? Now I know if I have a charge Q and I have a spherical surface, what is the flux to the spherical surface? Q by epsilon naught. We derived it and all of you will agree with it. You have no problem with that. Now what happens if I have some other surface which is not spherical but some arbitrary shape? surrounding, enveloping, covering the spherical Gaussian surface. Now I go back to my definition of electric flux. It's a measure of the number of lines of force that pass through that surface. Take any line of force. If that line of force passes through the sphere, it will also pass through my second surface. If I call this surface 1 and surface 2, flux through surface 1 is Q by epsilon naught. We've already derived. But what I am saying is any line that goes through surface 1 also passes through surface 2. Take any line. It passes through 1 and now it passes through 2. It passes through 1 and then it passes through 2. If it passes through, if any line passing through 1 equal, also passes through 2, that means this will also be equal to flux at 2. The flux through surface 1 is equal to flux through surface 2. But what was flux through surface 1? Q by epsilon naught. Therefore, flux in the irregular surface 2 is also Q by epsilon naught. That Gauss's law is true for any closed surface, no matter what its shape or size. I can still apply Gauss's law. Closed surface, net flux is Q enclosed by epsilon naught. End of story. Yep. Very simple, elegant, logical reason why it does not depend on the shape. Any line of force passing through surface 1 will also pass through surface 2. Okay, kindly note it down, first line. You do not need these diagrams and explanations, but make that statement. Number 1, Gauss's law is true for any closed surface, no matter what its shape or size. Okay, good. Point number 2. So what is Gauss's law? Flux equals Q enclosed by epsilon naught. So the second point, please write it down, states that the term Q on the right hand side of Gauss's law is the sum of all charges enclosed by that surface. The term Q on the right hand side of Gauss's law is the sum of all charges, all charges enclosed by the surface. So, if I have a body over here, this is Q1, this is Q2, this is Q3. Flux will be what by epsilon? 1 by epsilon naught times Q enclosed. Q enclosed is Q1 plus Q2. Should I worry about Q3? No, there is only Q1 and Q2. Therefore, flux is 1 by epsilon naught times Q1 plus Q2. On the other hand, let me give one more Gaussian surface over here. This is plus Q1 positive charge, minus Q2 negative charge, plus Q3 and outside I have minus Q4. Now what is the net flux in this case? It is 1 by epsilon naught times Q1 minus means Q minus minus Q2 plus Q3. So it's Q1 minus Q2 plus Q3 is your flux through that Gaussian surface. Okay, So kindly draw those two diagrams and write it down. So Q encloses the net charge enclosed inside that surface. Charges outside the surface do not matter. And if they are plus minus signs, you will add and subtract accordingly. Therefore Q enclosed in the first case is Q1 plus Q2. Q enclosed in the second case is Q1 minus Q2 plus Q3. That is the second note on Gauss's law. Now here is an interesting point. We learnt about internal and external charges on the flux. So suppose I have a Gaussian surface over here 
I have Q1 inside and Q2 outside. Flux through surface will be Q1 by epsilon naught or Q1 plus Q2 by epsilon naught. It is simply Q1 by epsilon naught. But suppose I have a point P here and I say electric field at P. depends on does it depend on q1 on q2 both q1 and q2 what does it depend on so from q1 there is going to be an electric field e1 from q2 there will be another electric field e2 both charges will exert electric field so electric field at p depends on both q1 and q2 not q1 plus q1 and q2 whereas flux flux depends only on enclosed charge only on q1 flux doesn't depend on q2 but electric field depends on q1 and q2 so please draw the diagram and write down electric field is due to all charges whereas electric flux is only due to the internal or I'll say enclosed charges. The electric field is, is due to all charges but the electric flux is only due to enclosed charges. This is a very interesting uh, question. Typically this will come in in your competitive examination. This is something people generally get confused with. The electric flux is Q enclosed by epsilon naught, but the electric field depends on all the charges that are available. Yes. Okay. Now we have three, four examples and we'll wrap up this lecture. I know it's been a heavy lecture, lots of new stuff. The numericals hopefully will be simple. First one, if the number of lines entering a closed surface is 20,000 and exiting is 45,000, calculate the net flux. Very simple. Exiting is positive, entering is negative phi net will be simply emerging as positive plus 45,000 and then entering so minus 20,000 which is equal to plus 25,000 is your net flux. Let's check if the answer is correct. Yeah. 25,000 is the answer. So please copy down the question. You say phi in in your data you can say phi in is, is 20,000 phi out is equal to 45,000. So phi net equals how much? That's your question. You can copy down example one and your answer phi net is equal to 45,000 minus 20,000 or 25,000 is the net flux through that closed surface. Okay. Very good. Example two. A charge 8.85 coulombs is placed at the center of a holosphere of radius 1 meter. Calculate the flux emerging from the surface. So you have a, a sphere, radius of the sphere is 1 meter and you have a charge Q inside. You want to get the flux. Flux is nothing but Q enclosed by epsilon naught. So I'd like you all to solve it. Give it a shot. Q encloses 8.85 coulombs, epsilon naught, I hope you all remember, 8.854, 10 to the power minus 12, or 8.85, 10 power minus 12. So substitute it and calculate the flux. So Q encloses 8.85, by epsilon naught is 8.85, 10 power minus 12. So it's simply 10 to the power 12. What are the units for flux I said? Newton meter squared coulomb minus 1. Let's check the answer. Yep, flux is equal to 10 to the power 12. Newton meter squared per coulomb. Direct application of Gauss's law. Flux is Q enclosed by epsilon naught. Please note it down. Example 2. Charge of 8.85 coulombs is placed at the center of a sphere of radius 1 meter. Calculate flux. And the answer is 
10 to the power 12 Newton meter squared per Coulomb. Very good. Example 3. Now it gets a little more interesting. Consider a uniform electric field 3 into 10 power 3 I cap. I cap means it's in which direction? I cap means it's along the x axis. What is the flux of this field through a square 10 centimeter side whose plane is parallel to the yz plane? I'll draw the diagram and we'll do it. So here the plane is parallel to the yz plane. And the second one, what is the flux to the same square if the normal to its plane makes an angle of 60 degrees with the x axis? So I cap is important and then square of 10 centimeter and the square lies parallel to the yz plane. So let me just draw the diagram over here. Um, you'll use the traditional x axis, y axis and then this is your z axis. The electric field is along the i direction. This is E bar. And your square plate is in the yz plane. This is your square plate. What is the area of the plate? Is side 10. So 10 times 10. And this is centimeters. So centimeters squared. Convert to meters squared SI units. That's 100 into 10 to the power minus 4 meters squared or 10 to the power minus 2 meters squared is your area that you have. Now the area vector is in the yz plane. So what is the normal to the area vector? N cap is along x axis. Therefore, what's the angle between E bar and N bar? Theta is 0. Therefore, what is cos theta? Cos theta is 1. Your flux is nothing but E into A into cos theta. I forgot the value of E. E was 3000. So 3 into 10 power 3 into area. 10 power minus 2 into cos theta is 1, which becomes 30. And the units again, Newton meter squared per Coulomb will be your flux. Let's check the answer. 30 Newton meter squared per Coulomb. I'll repeat again. The area is nothing but a square uh, a into a, which is 10 into 10, 100 centimeters squared, convert to meter. So 10 power minus 2 meters squared. N cap is also along x axis. E bar is also along x axis. Therefore, theta is equal to 0 or cos theta equals 1. Therefore, flux is equal to e into a into cos theta. E was 3000, a was 10 power minus 2, cos theta is 1 or 30 Newton meter square per column. Can we note it down? If we had a live class, I would invite questions from you all. You could have asked me and I've clarified whatever doubt you all had. Unfortunately, uh, this is a broadcast. I don't have you all in front of me, so I really can't anticipate your doubts. Uh, the WhatsApp numbers keep popping up on the screen. Feel free to write to your teachers. Teachers are available on call. They will answer and clarify your doubts immediately. Take a photograph, write down, explain, put your question. We'll be happy to help you all out. Okay, so that was part A. What is the flux through the square? Now, what is the flux through the same square if the normal makes an angle of 60 degrees with the x-axis? So now part B, part B, N cap makes 60 degrees with E bar, X axis is E bar. Therefore, cos 60 is how much? Is half. Therefore, flux will be nothing but the same E into A into cos theta, which is equal to 3000 into 10 power minus 2. But now you have an extra factor. Cos theta is half. So that becomes 15 Newton meter squared per Coulomb. Let's check both your answers. 30 Newton meter square per Coulomb and 15 Newton meter square per Coulomb are your two uh, fluxes. When the area is, is aligned along x axis, and in the second case, when it's an angle of 60 degrees to the x axis, cos 60 is half, therefore, the answer is 15 Newton meter square per Coulomb. Okay. 
Last example, we will do this and we will stop. A cylinder of length L and radius R is placed in a uniform electric field E i cap with the axis of the cylinder along the x axis. So, this is your x axis. You have a cylinder placed along the x axis and you have electric field which is uniform E i cap. What is the net flux through the cylinder? Phi net equals how much? Okay. Give you two minutes. You all try it. If you were able to pay any attention to what I taught you all so far, you should be able to solve this very easily. Not very difficult. Just take a minute and you should get the answer. What is the net flux through the cylinder? Flux entering is negative, flux leaving is positive. Keep that in mind and find the net flux. I see some of you are saying, hey, this is so simple. Why is it a trick question? What is the trick in it? There is no trick in it. It is a very simple question. Yes, if you figure it out that phi net equals zero, you are in the right track because any field line entering along this way will now pass through the thing and come out. No field line is captured within all field lines that enter will exit the uh, cylinder if a phi net is zero. Or you can say, if I call this surface 1 and I call this surface 2. Flux through 1 is equal to E into area is pi r squared and it's entering. So, it will be minus E into pi r squared. Both are in the same direction as far as x-axis is concerned. Phi 2 will again be E into pi r squared, but now it's leaving, so it is plus. And phi 3 is a flux through the lateral surface. Now my normal vector is like this, my electric field is like this. The angle between them is 90 degrees. What is cos 90 degrees? 0. Therefore, flux through surface 3 is 0. There is no field line cutting through the surface. It is all parallel to that surface, therefore flux 3 is 0. Add it all up, phi net will be 0. The electric flux through the surface is 0. Oh, sorry, I had some place to write. I wrote it over there itself unnecessarily. So, phi net equals 0. Okay. Please write it down, phi net is 0. Now, interestingly, if the cylinder was not along the x-axis, but the cylinder was in some random direction. Now what is phi net in this case? Electric field through a cylinder plays randomly in a uniform electric field. Once again you see any field line entering is exiting, any field line entering is exiting. So once again phi net is 0. Okay, I do not have a cylinder, suppose I have a sphere. Suppose I have a sphere placed in a uniform electric field. Now what is a phi net? Once again, anything entering is exiting, so phi net is 0. So if I have a uniform electric field, any closed surface I put in the electric field, the net flux is 0. Please draw these two diagrams also. I have a cylinder at an angle. And I have a sphere, or you can put any, you can put a cube, you can put a irregular surface, any surface, the flux through that surface will be zero. Okay, last example. It's looking a little lengthy. Yep, we just finish this off. It's given that the electric field is 200 I cap when X is greater than zero. It is plus 200 I cap when x is greater than 0 and minus 200 I cap when x is less than 0. A circular cylinder length 20 centimeters and radius 5 centimeters has its center at the origin and its axis along the x axis. So, one face is at plus 10, other face is at minus 10. What is the net flux through each flat face? What is the net flux through the cylinder? What is the net charge inside the cylinder? Same as last problem. So, if I draw the diagram, sorry, if I draw the diagram, you have your cylinder over here like this, your electric field. Ah, now there is a difference. He says, in this half, the electric field is to the right, the value is 200. 200 I cap 
but in this half this is x equals 0 in this half the electric field is to the left minus 200 i cap now the direction of the normal over here will be to the right n cap direction of the normal over here is to the left n cap so if i look at this electric field line is it entering or leaving it is going out leaving the surface if i look at this field line on the left is it entering or leaving this is also leaving the surface if i call the surface 1 phi 1 will be positive if i call the surface 2 phi 2 will also be positive and once again e bar and n bar are in the same direction so flux is nothing but e into a electric field is 200 radius is 5 so 200 into pi into 0 0.05 the whole squared which becomes let me see what the value is 200 into 22 divided by 7 into 0 0.05 into 0 0.05 is 1.57 newton meter squared per coulomb and here also the e and a are the same so phi 2 will also be 1.57 newton meter squared per coulomb what is the difference between this problem and the earlier problem earlier problem earlier problem was a uniform field the field was going like this and my cylinder was there so what entered was leaving but now my field on the right hand side is plus 200 i cap on the left hand side is minus 200 i cap my electric field is in opposite directions therefore both fluxes are now positive or phi net is equal to 1.57 plus 1.57 that's equal to 3.14 newton meter squared per coulomb yeah the important point in this example is to say that when my electric field directions are di refer di reverse different my flux will also change signs earlier example electric field was all going from left to right whereas here half was going to the right half was going to the left my net flux is 3.14 so flux through each surface is 1.57 1.57 net flux of the surface is 3.14 and the last question what is net charge so phi is equal to q by epsilon naught implies q is equal to phi times epsilon naught so that's equal to 3.14 times 8.85 10 to the power minus 12 so into 8.85 comes out to be 27.8 into 10 to the power minus 12 coulombs that will be a charge enclosed there is actually some charge over here this charge makes the electric field go to the right on the right hand side and to the left on the left hand side i told you also in field lines when field lines get interrupted they will have to be a charge so field lines were not uniform anymore the field lines were not continuous they were interrupted because there was some charge in between what is the charge 27.8 10 per minus 12 coulombs yep it's correct i was just checking the answer you can kindly note it down phi 1 phi 2 phi net and your q enclosed okay you can always go back pause the video and see this and read it up so i want to keep moving on with this i think we come to the end of the lecture what did we learn today? It has been definitely a, a heavy lecture. You've learned a lot. You learned the concept of electric lines of force. You learned about the properties of the lines of force. What is the concept of electric lines of force? It's an imaginary line along which a positive charge would tend to move. And properties of lines of force, tangent to the line of force gives the electric field at that point. The electric lines of force do not intersect. They'll start on positive and on negative. They will not form closed loops. They will be normal to the surface of a conductor and they will never intersect yeah these are some of the properties of lines of force you learn you learn the concept of electric flux electric flux is a measure of the number of lines of force that pass through a given surface uh, and how do you mathematically get electric flux electric flux is e bar dot a bar e into a into cos theta if you have a small area then e into da into cos theta is electric flux when theta is zero when e bar and a bar are in the same direction then cos zero is one it's simply e into a and when you learn that flux is a scalar or a vector 
flux is a scalar, electric field is a vector, area is a vector, you take a dot product and so you get a scalar result. How is area a vector? Area vector has magnitude equal to the area and direction is perpendicular to the surface. And using that we led on to Gauss's law which says that the net flux through any closed surface is equal to 1 by epsilon naught the charge enclosed by that surface. So that's all for today. That's the lecture for today. I think you guys are all a little tired. You'll be look, looking forward to a little stretch. But unfortunately, there's a homework to do. No learning happens if you don't do your homework. Number one, please review today's lecture. Go through the lecture. Write down your notes. Complete your notes. Fill up the blanks. The fact that you write it once itself makes it all sink in. So please write the notes. Make it thorough. Uh, read the NCRT book. Around five, six pages of Gauss's Law and Flux is covered in NCRT book. Read up the NCRT book and then complete the homework that will be posted on your Kaizala groups. There was a request from students to also print the solutions to the assignments. We will start doing that now. That you submit your assignment and the next day I will print the publish the solution. So all of you will have the solutions to your assignments. Wherever doubts you have, you check it out, talk to your friend, discuss it and get it clarified. But make sure that you are thorough with what has been taught. Uh, because as we keep going on, we'll keep building on what has been taught earlier. So make sure that day's learning is completed that day itself. So see you all tomorrow. All the very best. Take care. Stay safe. Study hard. And spend some good quality time with your family. It's a lucky time you have to be with them. Both mom, dad, kids all are at home. It's very rare that it happens. Make the most of it. Be grateful. Stay blessed. And be happy. Thank you and have a great day. Bye-bye.